Welcome everyone to our first masterclass of 2022, optimising the use of recycled materials in ancillary infrastructure. This webinar has been produced in conjunction with Ecologic and Tony Alessio will be our main speaker today. In June last year, some of you may have attended a CCF masterclass optimising recycled and reused materials in transport and infrastructure projects, <clears throat> which was also conducted by Tony. Before we continue, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land, the Wurundjeri peoples, in which we meet today and we pay our respects to elders past and present. I extend my respect to the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples here today. Now, I'd like to guide you through our platform and how it works and the different ways we can interact. On the right hand side of your screen, you'll see a series of columns and buttons. There's a chat room. I encourage you to engage and see who's participating in the webinar this morning. There is also Q&A buttons, and during this session, please type any questions you have in this section, and we will try and address them at the end of the session. We will be having a Q&A session after Tony's presentation. You will also see a handout section, but we will be adding the uh, PDFs at the end of the session. So please make sure you grab those before you leave. Also, Tony will be running some polls at the end of his session. They'll appear on your screen and you'll have a moment to answer and we will get to see the results of those polls. Finally, I'd like to acknowledge the government departments, agencies and partners that are on board today and in particular MRPV for their continuous support of CCF. Ecologic is a Victorian government uh, body and is committed to optimising the use of recycled and renewable materials in Victoria across all rail and road construction through and Ecologic Initiative is a recycled first policy. Ecologic was first launched in 2019 as an industry facing government initiative. To optimise the use of circular materials in Victoria's major transport projects and to reduce and waste and contribute to Victorian circular economy. By 2046, Victoria is expected to generate 40% more waste in a year than in 2017 and 2018, highlighting the need to grow the state's domestic recycling capabilities and create local markets for recycled content. This is where the Victorian government's ecologic initiatives come in. Ecologic is integrating recycled and renew, reused content across Victoria's transport infrastructure projects and making the use of green materials as business as usual. A key driver of this change is the Recycled First policy, which for the first time in Australia's history requires contractors building Victorian projects to optimise the use of reused and recycled materials. Recycled First has already led to more than 900,000 tonnes of recycled content going into our state's major ro road projects. This material includes recycled plastic, recycled glass, crushed concrete and brick, reclaimed asphalt and crumb rubber. And in fact, I see this every day along the Mordialic Freeway with the recycled sound walls. There's so much more to come and as Ecologic helps deliver purposefully greener transport infrastructure, it's a very exciting space to be. 
Ecologic is working closely with the construction industry to remove barriers to the use of recycled content, making sustainable materials the first choice where possible and pave a greener future for Victoria. The initiative is working with the Department of Transport to review and change the approach to technical standards and specifications for recycled and reused materials, as well as identifying priority materials for specification changes and type approval. Recycled First policy requires bidders on major transport infrastructure projects to optimise the use of Victorian recycled and reused materials that meet existing standards and specifications. This will see crushed glass, plastic, crumb rubber, recycled aggregates, ball blast, crushed brick and concrete and reclaimed asphalt pavement taking precedence over virgin materials. This marks the first time in Australia's history transport construction contractors have been required to use recycled and renewable materials. I'd like to now introduce Tony, who is a very enthusiastic presenter and passionate about what Recycled First is doing and also Ecologic and we're doing some very exciting works. An infrastructure leader, Tony Alessio, Ecolo Ecologic Project Director, is passionate about sustainability and an advocate for a purposefully greener future. Inspired by the opportunity to build a society where sustainable philosophies are put into action, in 2018, Tony completed the University of Cambridge Sustainability Leadership Program. He now combines his understanding of international best practice, sustainability with an in-depth knowledge of the local infrastructure in construction industry. Prior to Ecologic, Tony had a senior role with Fulton Hogan Australia and Boral Ashvelt, where he took on key roles in the delivery of a range of large scale projects, including the 2.5 billion East Link project. Tony leads a dynamic team who we love to engage with at Ecologic um, and who aim to optimise the use of recycled and reused materials on Victoria's infrastructure projects change the approach to technical standards and specifications and build market capacity and capability. It's with great pleasure I hand over to Tony now and uh, we look forward to hearing from you. Hey, thanks, Lisa. Uh, you can hear me okay, you're all good, I'm ready to go. Um, really appreciate the opportunity to be here and uh, thanks for those wonderful words of introduction. Um, uh, Today, I'm going to sort of take that introduction and talk a little bit about Ecologic. Um, I think Lisa's really covered very well what it is we do and why we're here, and talk a little bit about ancillary infrastructure. So we talk a lot about the building of the pavements of roads or the lines of rail tracks. And when we say ancillary, I think it's a really open palette for us to go and uh, establish what we can do that go outside of those main lines and we think about fence to fence the entire uh, piece of infrastructure and land that the government or the agency actually uh, operates within and and so we see really a lot of opportunities in this place that perhaps we haven't taken a lot of attention to so far so today we'll go through a little bit of that and see how that looks um, and at the same time understand that um, there are tremendous opportunities in both the traditional, if you like, materials in road and rail. I'm going to talk a little bit about um, some of the emerging products and some of the innovative products that are coming our way. Um, Lisa spoke a little bit about uh, the noise walls, for example, at Mordialic. I think it's really worth noting that um, 
uh, the big bill, the $80 billion worth of work that, the, that is unprecedented in, uh, in Victoria's history. And we're also seeing similar sorts of build happening in New South Wales and along the East Coast. Um, it has a voracious appetite for materials and for, uh, and for resources of all sorts. At the same time, we've got this um, uh, enormous um, uh, problem, uh, uh, waste crisis that has occurred as a result of the build-up that we that Lisa spoke about of uh, of waste materials and growing growing in twenty forty six to be a significant amount of a massive amount of material potentially, and the banning uh, the coag ban of taking plastics and other materials offshore. So we're building our stockpiles up full of these waste resources. And we have a massive requirement for resources over here in the big build. So part of, part of our work is to see, do we have a solution for these emerging products? And I really wanna to focus today a little bit on what we can do with emerging innovative products and how we can turn these waste resources into valuable, useful materials for us. Uh, I think that's a really important piece. And it's also worth noting that we as an industry have this tremendous opportunity to contribute to the Victorian uh, circular economy so do other industries and you, and you often see in the consumer world public views of things like recycled plastic bottles or you hear about Nestle taking their Kit Kat packets and going to recycle them. So they've got a job to do. Coles and Woolworths taking their red cycle type materials in. We all have a part to play and transport is a part of that world. Uh, and, and so we're we're joined at the hip, if you like, with other consumer-based industries and with and with the rest of society trying to trying to solve a very important problem. Um, I, I sort of feel like some of the emerging products, things like plastics, and we talked about consumer products like uh, like your milk cartons or your or your shampoos or what have you. Um, we talk a little bit about an emerging product like textiles. So. Um, uh, can we use textiles and infrastructure? And textiles are a major waste waste problem. So somebody who's working in recycling of textiles might come from the fashion industry or somewhere like that. Somebody who's working um, uh, with shampoo bottles or milk bottles might come from uh, might come from the beauty or the uh, or might be a chemist warehouse sort of person or what have you. Uh, whether your interest is in is in um, is in self care or whether your interest is in fashion or whether your interest is in infrastructure are actually all linked together. And there's a great opportunity to make those things work together and for us in the infrastructure world to take fashion, to take self-care and actually turn the products that they make into something useful in infrastructure. I hope that's where we go anyway. So just moving on, let's go with these slides. Um, we're going to be a world leader in the sustainable use of recycled and reused materials in the transport infrastructure space. We're already on the pathway. I think Lisa mentioned this whole, this entire ecologic program and the recycled first policy, all make us uh, all make us unique in Australia, and uh, and we're heading towards world leadership in this space. That's our aim. So we are this Victorian government initiative. Lisa's spoken about this. I'm not going to waste a lot of time on it. This is by way of introduction, by way of background for those who aren't aware of us. We do work across a range of, of key initiatives, uh, not just in infrastructure delivery, planning and design, but in helping to build the commercial frameworks that are really important to drive behaviour and to link into our contractual framework how we do this. We've been very instrumental in developing the policies that, uh, that make this happen. Uh, we also work closely with industry. By industry, I mean the markets that are actually emerging where a lot of suppliers and a lot of people are coming through and saying, I've got a product made out of this or I'm thinking of using this material and I have this idea. So we move that into innovation, into research and development and ultimately to make it business as usual, to make it the way things are always done, we put it into standards and specifications. So they're the areas that we work in to try to create this business as usual world that will change uh, the use of recycled materials from uh, what has up until now been a much something of an ad hoc opportunistic approach to something that that is the way we do business. Um, and it's just worth noting, uh, this industry has been uh, really positive about using recycled and reused materials. The, the opportunity we have is to make that far more deliberate and to move it into an innovative new emerging products world. I've just got to remember which, one, which buttons to press here on this thing here. Um, so 
we to do that we have to work together we have to work together with the civil contractors to embed the principles with suppliers and 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 both existing and emerging suppliers we have to work together to create trial approaches and extend beyond those trials to make that business as usual by putting them into standards and specifications as i said really important that we share lessons and celebrate successes i know that i spend a bit of time dealing with uh, some of our um, interstate and in some cases international brethren to actually uh, share what's going on uh, and learn from the world. There are some fantastic uh, um, organisations, things like uh, things like Planet Arc, things like the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. There is brilliant information about this worldwide and we need to be a part of that as well. Um, Sustainability Victoria is a really important partner of ours. Um, they also provide a lot of funding and support for research and development and we work very closely with them and for anyone listening, uh, SV are a great, a great place, a great resource to look to when you're looking to develop new or innovative products and wondering how you're going to do it in terms of government funding, they're the place to go. Uh, and one of the other key aspects is this focus on life cycle. So uh, not just for today, but cradle to cradle, uh, what is happening with, with our circular economy, when we design something to design out waste, when we use products that will last a long time and that are designed to reuse and at the end of life to recycle and repurpose either back into the same thing again or into something new. So that's sort of the broad spectrum of our work. I will talk a little bit about this really important factor of connecting supply and demand and it's one of the things we've found very clearly in our work is that especially with emerging suppliers, connecting them with the demand that is required, connecting them with contractors is like creating new relationships. It's like creating new understanding and new awareness. Uh, contractors and, and in transport infrastructure projects and including the delivery agencies are very used to their traditional, traditional supply chains, things like uh, quarries and concrete plants and asphalt plants uh, and steel manufacturers, that type of thing. Getting them to think about somebody who was turning plastic bottles into something that could be used in infrastructure, everyone can turn their mind to that idea. It is then making the connections and, and getting those connections uh, strong and valid uh, and understanding how to work together, uh, how we do work is really important. So we do a few things. We have a, a recycle and reuse demand. So there's a few things we have, a few tools that I'm mentioning here and a few resources. We've, we've developed a recycle and reuse demand model. It's actually forecasting what the big build is going to use in recycle the materials and require. So it provides a really good place for both contractors and suppliers and government to understand what's possible and therefore what they should be chasing. We've also created a very bespoke infrastructure supplier map, an interactive supplier map um, that uh, shows where all of the recycled material suppliers that we've been able to find um, and give some product information uh, and contact information uh, in this very interactive uh, map style thing. So very useful place for contractors and for, uh, and for designers uh, and for government to go and find people who are doing this stuff, who are building this stuff. Our Knowledge Hub is the place where this stuff is housed. It's, a, it's an intranet or an extranet uh, and it's available to contractors and other government partners as a place to go and find some of these resources. Moving on, some of the things we do in collaboration with industry and it's probably a key point I should make about Ecologic and about what this initiative is about. We're very much about taking uh, government which sort of feels distant, if you like, in terms of creating policy and mechanisms to, to do things. But we are deliberately and, and we sit inside the project world. So we have this ability to, to, to work across both those uh, aspects and to link those aspect, aspects of, of both government policy and delivery. So we're a, a real avenue to take uh, ideas into actual, actual actuality and delivery, I suppose, and implementation. So we really need to collaborate and work with industry. We have some fantastic events that we run. Uh, one of them is an innovation showcase series, and this is where suppliers, particularly emerging suppliers, pitch their products, talk about their products to uh, a really uh, towards a, a panel of experts, technical experts who can, uh, who are decision makers within government who can provide guidance and direction as to where to go with those products. We hope we have. We hold those every couple of months. And in fact, the first for this year is um, is next Friday. If, if anyone's interested in attending, um, you can contact uh, us at Ecologic. 
www.com.au and you will get to us and uh, I'll, you'll see that later on in the in the, um, in the presentation for a, for a contact point and you can come along and watch that and it's a little bit what, like watching a series of Shark, shark Tank if, uh, if you know that particular TV show. Similarly, we have these buyer supplier exchanges where we connect contractors to recycled material suppliers so the supply chain can get to know one another. We've done this a number of times last year and we will start again this year. We hold them quarterly. Uh, we do that online. We found that online works really well. It's a bit like speed dating where we put contractors and suppliers together for 10 minutes or so to get to know one another, to talk about their products, their materials, their projects. And we've had great success. We've heard a lot of feedback that, you know, a number of suppliers have been able to provide quotes and have moved to trial or to delivery as a result of that. It just gets those connections made. So that whole sharing uh, thing is really important. And we also work with suppliers and with contractors to help identify opportunities for trials, but also for funding. And I just wanted to make this, uh, this final point before I go to talk about the material side of it, is that we're working across the big build. So it is about, it is about transport delivery and it is all of those delivery agencies that are delivering all of the, uh, the, the major big build transport infrastructure projects. So major roads projects Victoria, which is where we sit as an organisation within that within that group. Rail projects Victoria at the moment they're looking, you know, at the Geelong Fast Rail, the Melbourne Airport Rail Link is being delivered by Rail Projects Victoria, and a number of regional rail projects as well. North East Link, I think we've heard all heard a lot about North East Link, massive mega project, um, um, just underway, and tremendous opportunity to, to perhaps be uh, Australia's greenest and greatest uh, road project in terms of in terms of what opportunity it has in front of it. Uh, the level crossing removal program, um, I think we've all probably been touched by that a little bit somewhere along the line. Beautiful, innovative organisation. They really look at doing things differently and making a difference in terms of sustainability and social procurement as well. The Westgate Tunnel, we know a lot about the Westgate Tunnel and they see that the big boring machines are now getting in there to, to uh, drill inside there, so that's very exciting. And another mega project that is just underway, the Suburban Rail Loop, um, connecting a whole heap of uh, suburban Melbourne together and a big program there. So all of those projects are places that the Recycle First policy and uh, applies and where Ecologic is, is working to help deliver uh, some of these outcomes. So what I'm put, putting in front of you, this one slide is the one thing to take out of this is opportunity. It is opportunity city when you look at all of that and say, wow, we can really make a difference. Okay, uh, I mentioned the Recycle First policy a few times. I thought I might just show you quickly the before and after effects of, uh, of Recycle First. Um, so it's not going to be, I talked about the shampoo industry and that before, it's not going to be a case of turning grey hairs to black, it's going to be uh, recycled material, it's going to be virgin material to recycle material. So let's have a look at what's been happening. Right now there are about 50 projects that have the Recycle First policy applied to it, um, as well as requiring bidders to demonstrate how they're optimising uh, their materials, it also requires them to report on it and Ecologic leads that development. Um, this, I've, I've also got to say that once contractors and once projects start doing this, they start thinking about, well, what else can I do? What's beyond just the, uh, the requirements of the contract or the allowable limits within the specification? Can I go further? It's one of the, one of the really positive things is that it gets people thinking uh, towards uh, greater goals as they go along. So right now, those 50, of those 50 projects, they start putting together a plan which gives, which puts their commitments. What are they going to do in terms of recycled materials, replacing virgin materials? We've got this dashboard that we're growing um, and there's a whole heap of materials that, that are in that dashboard. At the moment, there's eight projects, eight of those 50 projects commitments built into the dashboard, which goes close to a million tonnes worth of recycled material. And our dashboard starts to tell us how much of that is glass, how much of that is plastic and, and the like. We do it in tonnes so that everything's sort of worked out. But I have got to say, hey, if you put a tonne of plastic to replace, to replace concrete, it's probably replacing three tonnes of concrete just because of the relative densities of those particular products. So tonnes is a really good measure. It might, doesn't always show the entire picture in terms of what's possible and what's being achieved. 
So if we just look at this, and I'll just take you through this really quickly, uh, across the bottom line there, you see a whole heap of different uh, pavement uh, or road, this is a road projects uh, view. Uh, you'll see a whole heap of different applications, things like asphalt or culverts or, um, or, or drainage, crushed rock uh, and so on. Uh, and on the bottom line are three projects, an amalgamation of three projects before the Recycle First policy was, was uh, put in place. Um, and on the top line is the first of the, the first to be reported of the Recycle First projects. So the green part of the bar uh, is the amount of recycled material that was, that was uh, put in for any particular application as a percentage of the total of that material. So if I just look at the very first bar, um, you look at the asphalt and you can see about 25% of the asphalt that was placed uh, was in the was uh, had reclaimed asphalt in it. The red piece of the bar says that that's how much more recycled material the specifications are, would have allowed us to put in that we didn't do. So that's the opportunity lost, if you like. And the grey bit is the virgin material section. I think without going into this in any great any further detail than that, I think you can clearly see that there's a lot more green in terms of the applications on the top line as the recycled first policy has been applied uh, and a lot more red on the bottom line. And in fact, it's about 40% of the opportunity was taken in pre-recycle first on those three projects and close to 80%, almost double, uh, was taken in that first project above. You see a few gaps in the first project above, that's simply because this is one road and it's a suburban road and, and some, of those some of those areas, those types of applications weren't applicable. Um, so we're really seeing some success. I guess we're really pleased to see that success. Uh, the thing for us, as I've said a few times, is that some of that success is just doing more of the construction and demolition waste that was allowable, things like using crushed concrete instead of crushed rock, um, using recycled, uh, reclaimed asphalt and the like. What we're really fascinated by and really keen to attack are these emerging and new products. And it's where some of the ancillary opportunities lie and what we'll talk about as we go forward now. So on our intranet, on that uh, Knowledge Hub site, oh, uh, so we have uh, three recycled materials reference guides, one for road, one for rail, and one for what we call ancillary. And ancillary can be whatever you want it really in some respects, and they, and they can cross over if you like. So this, these reference guides, and this is the front page of it, actually show you very specifically in a very technical engineering sense, what are the materials that are in the specifications, what are the Australian standards and what are the Victorian DOT or V-line or rail operator um, standards and how much recycled material can go into it. And you can trace that very clearly through in one guidance and each of those lines then uh, finds its way to the actual uh, DOT standard and spec or the Australian standard that's applicable to it. Um, we did this because um, if you go and look at a DOT stand set of standards and specifications for a road, there's a whole range of different specifications and hidden within those specifications or as you read through the 50 pages of that specification, you'll find a reference on page 12 and then on page 24 and then on another page for recycled material uh, opportunities. What we've done is amalgamate that and put it into one ready reckoner, if you like, that actually puts it all together. So it's a great reference guide for people looking to what they can do on a project and giving them the real technical expertise and guidance to what is absolutely permissible. But I guess what we found is that we're not dealing just with engineers, and even if we are dealing with young engineers or with engineers broadly, they don't necessarily know everything about standards and specifications. Uh, and when we're dealing with others like sustainability people or people who are just interested in this project, in this uh, idea overall, uh, this might be quite daunting and overwhelming. And um, uh, in terms of doing it that way, some people are far more visual in the way they look at things rather than wanted to find their way through the minutiae of a standard or specification. So what we've created is this visual guide. And this visual guide, I think, is, has been really well received by the people that have seen it. We're only just releasing them at the moment. They're quite new. And what they do is just take you through a series of diagrams and pictures, if you, if you like, of a particular application. And then what is generally possible in that use or application. 
for you to go and explore a little further uh, if it suits your project and suits your interest. So what I'm going to do now is just take you through some of those some of those applications, if you like, in terms of an ancillary sense to give you a feel for some of the things that are possible. In a way, I'm hoping that all of everyone's going to get bored from here on in and say, yes, I know that, I know that, I know that. Yes, we're doing that. And, and if, if that's what's going in your head as I'm going through this, I'm saying uh, success, we've, we've got there already. Um, but maybe there's one or two things that uh, aren't there or that you haven't seen before and that, you, that will pique your interest and something you can follow through on. And one of the things I should have done with this presentation is at the end, leave a blank slide for you to fill in and say, these are some of the other ancillary applications. These are some of the ideas that I have. Where are they and what can we do about it? So um, take this guide, have a look at it. Uh, tell me that you know all about it already and you actually want to add to it. Then, then uh, I would be absolutely delighted. Apart from the fact that I might have bored you in the process. And uh, my dog has just walked into the room. He's going to be very quiet and sit there very peacefully, I'm sure. Okay, so so thinking about uh, things that are outside of the norm, if you like, or outside of just a road pavement or the tr traditional demolition materials or what have you, um, we can think about road safety barriers. This particular page talks about um, the uh, amount of fly ash or other things that can be put into the concrete. It talks about the fact that recycled steel can be used to uh, manufacture some of those uh, some of those uh, products there. And it also talks about where we can go further. So really importantly, you'll see a little green circle there that has C in it. That just means if you look at the legend at the bottom, approved and common. The A says it's approved in blue. The A is approved, but it is less commonly used, less commonly applied. So, you know, if you're looking at that and saying, I want more uh, recycled fly ash in my, in my concrete because it's a good thing, um, I need to go and talk to my concrete supplier about whether they can do that and where they're at with it. And, and in terms of innovation, how far can we go with, where we get to the point of really low carbon concrete when we can get to uh, higher levels of alternative materials in there. Just as a little taste of it, we'll start with that. Um, Lisa spoke about the noise walls down at Morty Alec, and we're so excited, world first noise wall with 75% recycled plastic, hasn't been done before. Um, 570 tonnes of plastic went into that project. That's about 25,000 households worth of, uh, of uh, plastic bins for a year that, that have been put into that. And the alternative were uh, steel or concrete panels. Um, and it's a really good example of taking uh, an innovation, an idea, making it work. We had to work very hard with the supplier to actually build it up to 75%, proving that it could be done, uh, demonstrating it, and then taking it beyond that and into standards and specifications. And it's now completed as a standard and specification going into the Department of Transport's um, documents. Um, I, it's complete. Uh, I understand there's a little bit of formatting to do, so the artwork people need to uh, need to get it to actually conform with the uh, the way DOT put their standards and specifications. But it's there and available. And really interestingly, it's not a standard specification about plastic noise walls. It's a standard specification about noise walls. So it it talks about what are the properties, what are the outcomes that a noise wall has to achieve. Well, first of all, it has to stop noise going through it. Uh, but it may need a whole heap of other properties in, in terms of its structural soundness, in terms of its durability, in terms of its lifespan, in terms of its graffiti resistance, fire resistance, uh, a number of other attributes. And if you put those together and say, that's what I want from a noise wall, then I guess you can make a noise wall from anything. That You combine that with a recycled first policy and you have an answer that says recycled plastic might be the way to go in future noise walls. And we're really excited to be working now with some of those partners I spoke about before, Rail Projects Victoria on the Melbourne Airport Rail Link and also North East Link, where there will be a number of noise walls required, a lot of noise walls required across those projects. And we're excited to expose them to this opportunity and see if we can uh, really turn what, you know, turn what I, when I use the the term business as usual, turn that into reality in those projects. Uh, drainage, it's been um, uh, recycled 
plastic, 100% recycled plastic drainage pipes to replace concrete pipes. You see a picture of them there. Um, they look quite pretty actually when you see them in, in colour um, because of the speckled nature of them that you can sort of pick up there. Uh, they have become, they've been around since 2005 and have been used uh, a bit. Uh, they've been used in agricultural applications. The difference that the Recycled First policy and the work we're doing at Ecologic is that when now contractors are now saying, how do I get a, a better recycling outcome? How do I get a better circular economy outcome? And they're going to these products now as their, as their primary choice, as opposed to, um, well, well, I've got a good relationship elsewhere or I've always used other things, so I will continue to. So um, that's the power of the, uh, of the uh, application of the policy and the mindset and the desire of people to do this. Once you've got the pipe in the ground, there's a number of things uh, uh, that can be done in terms of um, in terms of um, bedding that pipe in and putting that pipe in place. Uh, in terms of now taking the challenge further, we've got a recycled plastic pipe. Um, can the concrete pipe industry think about geopolymer concrete as a way of reducing its carbon content and using some recycled materials as well to create some competition and to and to drive improvement as we go. And then the bedding, so uh, recycled crushed glass uh, as a bedding material to replace sand. We can even use recycled sand or re reused sand, if you like. Um, and then, so once, you, once you've got the pipe, you start thinking about the drainage pits, the lids, all of these things are quite common to use recycled materials or quite commonly available. It's a matter of deliberate application and saying, yes, this is what I'll do. Uh, I might talk about um, uh, ITS because it is a you know a, a really important piece of the puzzle and infrastructure these days and, and a growing one with electrical work. So when we look at the electrical work, we think, well, that's electrical. What's that got to do with uh, with us? But there's a whole range of things um, apart from just the fact they have to use traditional materials like concrete and cement and the like. Uh, they've got to put pipes in, so they again can recycle these can use recycled plastic in these smaller pipes. They can use recycled steel when they're reinforcing the concrete as well. And as we go along, um, the conduit backfill, uh, there's a range of different applications, commonly uh, crushed concrete or recycled rock or crushed brick. Uh, approved, but less common, is to use uh, other things like slag aggregate or reclaimed asphalt. Can I just say, we could put a line through that and say reclaimed asphalt's value is to go back into asphalt. Its highest value is to go back into asphalt. And it's probably something I haven't spoken about already, but one of the principles is use recycled materials for their highest order value. And, and in this case, um, um, you'd be crazy to put your wrap in there unless you had nowhere to take it and you're out in the middle of the bush or something. Um, you should put it back into, into new asphalt. Um, and as an innovation in this place, and it is a bit of an innovation in electrical work, is and we're, and we're moving there with some trials, is to use crushed glass as well in, in these sort of conduits. Great opportunities in landscape and urban design, just all over the place. Uh, coloured surface treatments using recycled glass sand. Um, you can do that with line marking as well. This is a reflective paint as well that can be done. There's, a, there's an organisation doing stuff with reflect with high reflectivity as well. Um, temporary bollards and making them from recycled plastic. So just little things, they all add up and make a difference. Uh, I'll talk a bit more about um, bollards a, a little bit in a, a few minutes. Uh, and the same with temporary uh, traffic barriers, which can be made from recycled plastic as well. You hear a lot of, about plastic. What we're finding is that plastic is, um, is, the, is the big hit in terms of emerging products. There are lots of opportunities to use it and to think creatively with it. Like this, like tactile ground surface indicators, um, just a little thing. Uh, recycled plastic crumb rubber, and recycle still all approved and and not common at all. So we need to perhaps find manufacturers who are prepared to uh, go down that path. And then this sort of stuff, um, end of ride facilities. If you're uh, if perhaps if you're building a level crossings removal program, or if you're into um, vertical construction, um, these sort of things, or car parks, or your local Woolies, 
or what have you. These these things are just no brainers. Um, they absolutely should be used, and they will take up the use of crumbed rubber. They'll take up the use of plastic. Uh, they'll take up recycled steel opportunities as well. Um, uh, it's amazing now that I've been doing this job. How every time I go to my local um, my local Woolies, I go and make sure I knock those things pretty hard with my tyres and go and test them uh, and then go and look and see if they're made from recycled materials. And let's think about this sort of stuff. So permanent bollards, bus shelters using recycled plastic sheeting uh, is an innovation that perhaps no one's taken up yet. Um, all of these types of things are greatly available. There's a couple of pings going there. I hope that's some questions coming in. I hope so. I look forward to that later on. I think we're starting to see a bit of this, a bit of furniture. Um, I see a fair few of these um, uh, these seats uh, made from recycled plastic. Um, but you know, we think about signage, we think about uh, a range of different opportunities there, and you know, we can we can recycle timber as well into those sort of things as well. Um, organics, so soil and mulch. Um, um, right now. You know, tonight my bin goes out uh, and it'll it'll have my green waste in it, it'll have my food waste in it. That goes, I know, off to the council transfer station and then it becomes a, a process for them to turn that into um, a mulch product, which is fully available for us to use as the, um, uh, as the treatment for landscaping on a range of projects. Um, and then there's things like edging products and the like, uh, things like tree guards, all of these things are just opportunities waiting to be had. They're, um, they're approved, they're not all that common. Um, we've got to encourage the suppliers and the industry to make these things and the way we encourage them is by, is by um, committing to using them. Before we commit to using them, we have to understand that these opportunities arise and exist which is a little bit about what today's about. I'm hoping you're gonna tell me if some other uh, questions you have or opportunities you, you think of that, uh, that could find their way into this world. Um, we've put this as an innovation, so we haven't seen this before, but functional fitness equipment. Now, I don't know if you're a road builder or a rail builder, you may not do that, but you may want to uh, be, uh, you may have to, or you may have in your contract to actually put some facilities in place on your road. Uh, but if you're not building road or rail and you're working for local government or, or what have you and building parklands and uh, play areas and ovals and the like, um, you know, why not is really the question here. Basketball courts, um, crumb rubber is a great, uh, crumb rubber is a great thing because it's soft on your feet. Um, and so, you know, rolling your ankles, particularly those netball players and what have you, it's just, provide a little bit of give and it's an innovation someone needs to have a look at I think all right so there's a and and if you like that that reference guides and and uh, those visual guides and we'll do a road rail and a um, and an ancillary one uh, will, will also be available and they're a really nice easy flick through to actually read through it and go oh okay here's an idea here's a thought that's great I'm just going to give you a few examples then of things that have been done already um, just to uh, wrap this up before we go into some Q&A and the like. Um, we talked about uh, recycled plastic noise walls and the Mordial Oak Freeway is, uh, is the great example of that. All of these things come with challenge and the challenge, challenge in this case might be aesthetic. So do we like a plastic noise wall? Do we like the look of it? I can say these are rotationally moulded panels. You can shape them and form them any way you like and you can colour them in your, any way you like. But it one of the key stakeholders here are the urban designers uh, and including the state government architect. Um, so, you know, there are, when you go to do something new, there are always going to be challenges or, or barriers or, and I shouldn't call them barriers so much, there are going to be like stakeholders and, and issues to, to deal with and to make good. And in the case of noise walls, it is urban design. And really, I think uh, recycled plastic noise walls are a great opportunity for brilliant urban design. I keep telling my team that I want to get Banksy to do uh, to, to paint one of these um, or to build uh, one of his little uh, monikers into into the imprint of a of these panels um, and make them the most valuable part of the um, of the whole piece of infrastructure. If we could get that to happen, that wouldn't that be something? 
Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about eMesh, uh, which is a um, which are plastic fibres that uh, replace steel fibres in concrete reinforcement. Um, and there are some challenges there because we have to get awareness and uh, demonstration that uh, it has the quality and durability and strength that's required. Um, and we have to get our key stakeholders like local government to, um, to work with us to make that happen. Um, I've mentioned the, the plastic drainage pipes. So now we have a huge growth in the amount of drainage pipes being delivered. So that puts challenges and stresses on, the, on that supply chain. And this is about building something new. So whenever you build something new, there's going to be some peaks and flows. You know, the demand suddenly outstrips the supply or there might be quality issues because you're being rushed or uh, it's a new product and you have to handle it a little bit differently because people aren't used to handling it the same way. Um, and uh, one, of the, one of the big ones is uh, recycled plastic composite railway sleepers, which diverts, which can divert a lot of plastic into rail when you think about replacing a timber rail sleeper and just how many there are, and there are millions, uh, with a plastic one potentially. Uh, what does that do? At the moment, they're approved for low speed. Our questions are, can we make them, can we make them approved and work and prove that they work for higher speeds? So uh, there's the plastic pipes. And I think I've talked about what the, um, what the opportunity is, and it really has grown um, greatly. At the moment, they're also only approved to go outside the road pavement or the rail structure. They're not approved to go underneath because there's questions about how much load can they bear and, and that's got to be proven. But, um, but we really challenge the market, the supply market there, and it's stepping up too, I've got to say, to actually supply and to supply the right quality materials. There's also some work to be done with, some con with, with the contracting industry to get them to understand how to handle and use a product that is different, uh, a material that is different. So eMesh, um, so that picture there shows some concrete with the fibres sticking out. These are the plastic uh, fibres. They're manufactured in this case in by this uh, supplier in Ballarat. And one of the fabulous stories with that is that the they're packaged and they're packaged by a, a, an organisation that is an NDIS, so National Disability Services, supplier so there's a uh, um, there's a, little, uh, a little warehouse there where where it's um where the, where it's packaged by by that organization and those people so it's providing great social outcomes for disadvantaged people and for people with disabilities and it's also providing a product that works in shared user parts and we've used these in the shared user parts at morty alec um, and on a number of level crossing removal programs we're working closely with some councils to actually have them put into some of the council road uh, upgrades that we're doing um, really for those councils. It's like, let's do this as a trial, as an evidence that it can work and let's ensure that we're careful about it and have a measured way of, of growing this market. But it's growing very rapidly right up and down the uh, east coast from north of Cairns all the way through to Melbourne and, 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 uh, and beyond. So um, we see this as a, as a terrific uh, future opportunity. In things like non-structural concrete for now, like shared user paths uh, and the like. I mentioned I was going to talk about the bollards. So the bollards really uh, is a really exciting thing for me because um, there are, oh, how many bollards are there in Australia? Who knows? Uh, they all come, they're all imported from virgin plastic. And of course, they have a pretty short lifespan because they get hit, they get knocked over, they get uh, they get covered in bitumen and so they're no longer suitable for purpose so they end up just getting thrown out and new ones get bought and they're pretty cheap so people just chuck them out it's built into the price of the traffic controllers price or the company's price and we keep doing it there's now an organization um and then, for example four four thousand bollards collected from one project um there's now an organization uh who are uh, who we've uh, and through our Shark Tank series that I spoke about, we we introduced them to the market here. Um, who are now um, uh, taking those old bollards and recycling them, making new bollards out of them. They're a social uh, enterprise, um, so we're doing the same again. We're providing people with uh, people who are disadvantaged and with disabilities um, work a, pla a place to go, and we're recycling thousands and thousands and thousands, or they will be, 
and they would and I really have to follow up on them, but uh, they were due to start like they're new and emerging. They're very new, um, and so they were due to start manufacturing about now. So I'm not quite sure where that's got to, and I, I need to follow that up. But if you've got a project, you might be buying bollards. Uh, you might have traffic control companies who are who are the subcontractor to the contractor. So you know we've got to be talking to those to those traffic control companies and to the contractors and saying, why not? This is a real no-brainer and a great opportunity to do something good for people and to do something good for um, for our recycling effort. Okay, plastic railway sleepers I spoke about. Uh, the first commercial use of plastic sleepers is about to happen, uh, about 400 plus sleepers uh, up around Shepparton on, on a regional rail line in the sidings only where there's low speed so up to 40 kilometers an hour uh, is where it will go uh, and we're looking to do trials to see if we can take this as well as some r d to see if we can develop this product further uh, that's just 500 sleepers i thought it was 440 was the number i had in my head but i'm happy to um, happy for them to take 500 if they can yeah um, <laughs> Uh, and there's a lot of plastic goes into into these sleepers, which is a, so it's a great sink for them as well. Um, with these come a whole bunch, you know, the whole the whole gamut of performance, lifespan, um, maintenance, uh, cost. All those things have to be worked out and considered. But it's uh, it's fabulous, and I really want to give a shout out to Rail Projects Victoria, who are really um, leading the charge and saying, yeah, we want to do this. Uh, here's another simple example, 80% um, recycled glass in these uh, curb s separators. So um, this, is, this is Melbourne City, obviously, um, but anywhere where you're separating perhaps for cyclists um, or, or pedestrians in a low uh, in, a, in a low profile environment like this, um, you can be using this instead of, instead of uh, virgin concrete type applications. Um, there are opportunities, and you would have seen some perhaps for, for crumbed rubber or for recycled plastic type separators as well. So there's some architectural potential um, questions about what you prefer, what you don't prefer, what works better. Um, but this product's uh, durable, it's low maintenance, it's flexible and, 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 it, and it provides that structural integrity that people are looking for. Okay, we're nearing the end in terms of the slides here. So I just want to talk to you about what we're doing at Ecologic this year and what opportunities there are for you to be involved if you're interested. Um, I mentioned earlier this industry innovation showcase. We were calling it Shark Tank. We thought we'd better knock somebody probably owns that name, but it's that style of approach for, for uh, emerging suppliers and for innovative suppliers to pitch their material, their, their products or materials to. Um, this Friday at 10.30 a.m. Uh, that webinar will be on. Um, uh, I mentioned the ecologic, ecologic exchanges, so that's this buyer supplier get togethers, which you will hear about as we go along the year. Um, and there's another thing called a lunch and learn that we do on a, uh, on a Friday, um, and we haven't launched them for this year yet, they'll be on again soon, uh, where we really bring in a technical expert, somebody who knows a lot more about the specifics of a particular product, whether it's uh, reclaimed asphalt or or crushed concrete or a plastic product or the use of crumbed rubber, um, all those types of, or organics, all those types of things. And we have to get a technical expert in, in the field to come and do a bit of um, Q&A uh, over lunch. Uh, you can sit there and watch and learn. Uh, we, we've got some great responses from various, uh, from, from a variety of these uh, and really um, some really lovely people who, who gave up their time to come and talk about it and obviously passionate about it and know a lot about it. So if you want to know about something uh, in a bit more detail, they're a great place to go. Uh, we're contactable at uh, ecologic at roadprojects.vic.gov.au. I really stuffed that up at the start when I, when I talked about, uh, talked about uh, what that contact number is, but that's it right there. So you can see it, uh, you can't miss it really, yeah. Okay, so that was sort of like all in terms of the slides. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna to move to questions, but just before I move to questions, I will just mention again that the handouts, I hope are, are up by now or should be there, um, and certainly be there soon to for you to download as well. And, um, 
again, j uh, and then we'll move to questions shortly, but I did want to um, um, just run a couple of little polls. So I want you to do some work. Um, and I'm going to ask you just three questions, if you like. Um, you'll have a few seconds to answer it. They're pretty, pretty quick and easy to answer. Uh, so I'm going to put the first one up now, and I'll give it a, I'll give it a minute, and then, uh, and then stop that poll and move to the next one. Here we go. It looks like it's got a lot of answers already. Have somebody else do that for me already or not? Okay, how are we going, um, Lisa, Marco? What do you think? We'll keep going for a, a little longer? It's, yes, uh, I'd go to the next the next poll. Seems like they're... Um, People are going through it. Seems like they're all open at once, from what I can see. I thought they were going to go one at a time, but they all seem to be uh, being answered anyway. Okay, so let's we'll close that one. We'll just move on to the next. Still seeing a few responses come through. Still the numbers going up a little, so I'll give it another 30 seconds or so. Yeah, another one just came in, so it's good. A strong um, response to having a workshop with Ecologic, though, so yes, you know, work for us, it's good. That's very exciting. So I, I think while we're waiting for those results to come through, I'd just like to extend my thanks to Tony. Uh, CCF is is supporting Ecologic in, in building knowledge across the civil industry to help people think first, recycled and renewable materials. Uh, I love the showcase idea, the Shark Tank presentation, as well as the speed dating. And I would encourage all of you Friday, 25th of February, for the innovation showcase. I know that the last one that uh, you ran, Tony, was highly successful and it's great that you've extended this further um, to the broader community. Uh, Stephen Smith, thank you for your question. It's fantastic to see that you've got the um, reference guides, Tony, and the visual guides, which are hot off the press this month. Um, I do believe that you need to engage and register with the Knowledge Hub. Um, Stephen is asking, is the recycled materials and ancillary infrastructure mm -hmm. reference guide available online? And I, I think that uh, you need to register with, with your Knowledge Hub. Yeah, yeah. So, so uh, those, uh, that, that technical one that I spoke about, those reference guides, they are available now. These um, um, these guides, the the visual guides, uh, we're just still uh, polishing them up and giving them a shine, and uh, they'll be available soon. But if you go onto the um, if you go onto the um, uh, uh, knowledge hub, you will you will um, you'll see them there. Uh, they're also what we've um, um, provided for you in the handouts now as well. Oh, fantastic. Um, and I really love to what you're talking about with um, social enterprises seem to be engaging in this space 
too, Tony. Yeah. Um, and it's just such a feel good uh, overall space to be in. So you helping the planet and also helping the community and um, and and that's just fantastic. Um, I really love the fact that we're leading in Australia with a number of initiatives and it would be fantastic to see these recycled materials for things like our sleepers for rail. Um, the cost, though, tends to be uh, potentially a challenge. And I know there's been quite a lot of um, probably R&D invested uh, to build these products. Um, but things like the sleepers, don't they last longer? Um, and therefore, is that an incentive? So we're trying to create products that are actually going to be um, better than uh, using new materials. Yeah, I think there's a few things. Firstly, uh, re recycled materials sometimes cost less than the virgin materials, sometimes cost something similar and uh, like the bollards uh, and sometimes they cost more uh, in today's market and the way things are that and uh, that's uh, that's in terms of just a direct today cost thing but i think when you talk about circular economy we are talking about the entire life cycle of a product and we're talking about the circularity of that product at the end of its life so they're able to reuse and repurpose it if we look at the railway sleepers um compared to uh, the timber replacement world, you know, where you've got to knock down hardwood forests to get those timber sleepers. Mm. Um, the the the, um, the composite sleepers that we're talking about will last probably three times as long in terms of a lifetime. They'll, they'll be 40 years compared to 10 to 15 uh, on, a, um, on a timber one. So maintenance costs and replacement costs obviously are well down. Um, but each product will be unique. And it's also worth noting that when you, if you're a manufacturer and you're building something for the first time and you're introducing products to market, you don't have economies of scale. You probably haven't got your processes as refined as someone who's been in, in, in the game for 20 years doing a traditional product and has honed and used continuous improvement practices, all those great Japanese sort of things that Toyota created to say, yes, I can, I've got this efficiency down to, to a perfect mm. thing. So usually new products cost more and then they get cheaper over time. And we see that with con consumer products, whether they're mobile phones or televisions or electric vehicles, um, which um, you did have to be a millionaire to buy one. Um, but, you know, we will see electric vehicles, everyone will be using them and they'll, 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 they'll be cost effective. So you've got to that's part of the commitment and it's part of the reason we say optimize because we really take into account that hey you've got to get price you've got to get uh, quality you've got to get health and safety you've got to get logistics you've got a range of things to work out um, to to make it work and that's what we're here for so what i would say about price and cost though is that when we talk about value over the life cycle of a product if you've got an idea if you're worried about cost you know level crossing removal program we've got a specific project where they're saying for this particular project we're not going to do it everywhere but for this particular project put cost to the side let's work about the innovation and understand what it is or the opportunity and then we'll understand what we're what we're prepared to invest in it so you've got a good idea bring it forward give it a crack i think is the uh, is the answer there Yes, uh, so so Stephen has uh, posted another comment in the chat there in just saying that he struggles with the transport costs being significantly higher for recycled materials on sites, which are generally on the peninsula and further east. Is that something that you're aware of or? Yeah, so, so um, I love what you're saying there, Stephen. I don't know what you're saying. I love the fact that you've brought it up. Um, be in touch, please, and we'll talk about, about it a bit more uh, when we get the chance. It's, it is a, a real, so we have a regional um, strategy, if you like, a regional market strategy. So one of the reasons we work with markets is, is for this very reason that we recognise that sometimes these recycled materials um, are not available in certain markets because the supply is not there and there is a, a supplier of virgin like crushed glass um you know it may have to come from if it's coming from the western suburbs of melbourne and you're trying to get it down to the peninsula well good luck with that sort of thing i, I fully appreciate it um particularly when you've got this uh, i've seen some sand down the peninsula way i think they've got a bit of sand down that way so um you know i i fully appreciate that uh it's part of the growth and evolution of of these markets and we're working 
uh, on a regional strategy because we definitely see that the amount of recycled material that's used in regional projects, and I won't call peninsula regional, I think, uh, I think there's been enough debate about that through the, the COVID period about whether the peninsula is part of Melbourne or part of a region. <laughs> but, um, but what we do find is that yet yeah, we get less opportunities the further we spread away from Melbourne. The supplier map we've got, Stephen, might be a place to just have a look and see what suppliers we know of in various, all over Victoria. Um, and uh, I'd be interested in you highlighting what your issues are so that we can go and have a look and see, can we encourage any growth in those markets down that way? So be in uh, touch. Thank you. And uh, this is always, always a bit of a hot topic, uh, Tony, but uh, the concerns on warranties of new materials uh, that have never been used mm -hmm. and just looking at what Ecologic can do to provide um, help to contractors and encouraging them to go for this innovation. Um, obviously, in a risk averse economy, um, people are concerned about what liability uh they're going to have for using that particular product yeah yeah absolutely it's a great question so uh, there's a few uh, there's a few avenues to take but again it's about taking something new and turning it into business as usual so what are the processes to get there and what are the steps to get there and how do we make how do we do that in a safe way so clearly uh we start with some performance expectations of 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 recycled materials and our, our our aim is that the performance of these products should be at least as good as a virgin material product. The way we demonstrate that and actually manage that in terms of warranty is that um, we start potentially, if it's a if if it's a risk, we start with trials and with and we work with the standards and specifications uh, owners. In in a road case, that's the Department of Transport who own the standards and specifications that says I don't know. Asphalt needs to perform this way, whether it's recycled or not recycled, it needs to have these, these abilities to withstand rutting, to, um, uh, to uh, be flexible, whatever the case may be. So we understand what the criteria are and we can put them into trial applications. We've got a number of trials um, coming ahead with us at the moment. For example, um, recycled crushed concrete and glass, com crushed glass put together can provide a very stable road base. And we've done that in roads. We're now going to do a trial. We're looking to do a trial of that in a rail sub base sort of uh, approach. So we'll do that as a trial uh, and that will be excellent um, uh, when, it, when it's completed. Similarly, um, uh, we will take other materials and other products through that same trial process and demonstration process. At the end of the day, I talked about it being business as usual. That means that going into standards and specifications. Mm. Once it's in the standard and specification, that then becomes the Bible of what's permissible and usable uh, for your project. And the warranties, the defects liability will all apply similarly to this product, which needs to perform at that same level. Um, so that that is a really good segue, I think, perhaps, Tony, to just mention who um, who is in your team at Ecologic? Yeah, right. So we've got a small team. We're about there's about nine or ten of us um, in the day of the week. I think a little bit, but we run these we run these three very important streams. One being um, uh, one being the recycle first implementation stream. So this is the the stream that works directly with contractors and project teams. Uh, to work on their recycled first plans and on what they're going to commit to for a project. So Luke Host and, and Alex work in that area there. And some of you may know Luke or know of Alex if, you, if you're in that place. We then have a technical stream. Uh, Shalini, who's only joined us for, uh, for about a month, is our technical manager. So, so her role is to um, foster that innovation, those trials, and to demonstrate, as we asked before, what are the technical standards and specifications and are they being met? Uh, and so her work is then to get that, get our materials into standards and specifications. And then we have the very exciting industry market development stream led by DOI, uh, with Lauren supporting it as well. And so DOI tends to run those um, those fun events like the, uh, like the buyer supplier exchanges and the innovation challenges or Shark Tank that I spoke about. 
Um, so there are three main streams. We run com communications as well so that we get this material out to people and someone puts these clever slides together for me to present. And then overall program management by, by Leanne Griffin. Uh, and Leanne is a fabulous uh, person and, uh, and a, a, a great source of knowledge and support to the, in, uh, to the entire industry. That's us, I guess, uh, in a nutshell. Uh, certainly a small team, but pack a punch. And you also work across MTIA as well? Absolutely. So, uh, so like I said at the start, uh, we work with uh, all those agencies. We also work with, um, uh, uh, with a number of government departments from the policy and delivery. And like I mentioned, State of Victoria and DELP and those sorts of organisations yep. linked together. Well, I I think based on the questions, uh, we'll probably bring that to a close. But I just want to emphasise uh, if you have any questions, you want to register with the Knowledge Hub, go to ecologic at roadprojects.vic.gov.au. And Cheryl West has uh, kindly put that email address in there. So that's your go-to place for any questions and also to register. Uh, don't forget the workshop, the innovation uh, showcase that'll be happening on Friday, the 25th of February. So I just want to uh, let people know before we go, uh, registrations for CCS, Regional Chapter Forum in Warrigal, which will be taking place on the 24th, so the day before, uh, the main speakers are Henry Lamb, Acting Director, Gippsland Regional Transport, Department of Transport, uh, Colin Van Der Weld, Director of Community of Infrastructure from Borbor Shire Council, and Colin Young, who is an industry advisor for the Industry Capability Network. And finally, on the 3rd of March, we have the CCF Victoria Rail Breakfast, which will be held at Kuyong Tennis Club. Uh, we're very privileged to have Corey Hannett, the Victoria's Director General, Major Transport Infrastructure Authority, so uh, MTA colleagues, uh, and certainly Tony would uh, have a close relationship with Corey. And uh, we also have Bede Noonan, Chief Executive Officer from ACCI. ONA Geotech Holding and we have Tony, the uh, Director of Ecologic, who will be speaking and we just love having Tony. It's fantastic to, to have you and to be able to provide this opportunity for to get the message out of such important uh, concepts and uh, work that they're doing across Victoria, um, across our major projects and what they're able to do to support contractors as well as our innovators and providing a, a voice. I really see that uh, you guys are great conduits in connecting people together as well and we want to support that. So. Um, well done, Tony, on a, another fantastic presentation. I, I look forward to seeing you on the 3rd of March again uh, and your team as well. And uh, I wish you a great week. Thanks for joining us. Yep. Thank you.